unfortunately, those floors that the mold was under in that first house were the same floors my son learned to crawl on. And so at, you know, three months, six months, he was having good well child checks. He went back for his next one and he had um, abnormal muscle function, abnormal tone. We started to notice he wasn't sitting up and his hand was clasped, you know, clasped and, and drawn up and his toes were curled on one side. And so he ended up being diagnosed with um, cerebral palsy. They said at some point he had a stroke. You know, looking back at that time, they're like, oh, these things just happen sometimes. The doctors were like, you know, we never really know what happens. But I know I know now like what happened, um, because the second we moved back into that same neighborhood, same type of housing, there was mold present, his seizure started and everything just got worse. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Your Indoor Air Podcast brought to you by Change the Air Foundation. My name is Kendra Seymour. Now, my guest today is Casey McCurry, and she is a powerhouse, let me tell you. She is a devoted mother of three and a military spouse whose journey from hardship to advocacy has been profoundly impactful. And as a military family, Casey and her husband experienced the challenges of frequent moves between duty stations. However, their lives took kind of a drastic turn when they encountered toxic mold in military housing, sparking a transformation in Casey's path. Rather than allowing her adversity to define her, Casey's channeled her experience into advocacy for military families facing similar struggles. She's become a vocal person and presence in the media, sharing her story to raise awareness and drive change. Currently, Casey serves as the Director of Intake and Client Advocacy for Personal Injury Law Firm, specializing in exposure cases. Their work includes the landmark Red Hill lawsuit, representing over 7,000 active duty service members and their families, as well as local Hawaiian civilians affected by water contamination issues. Through her unwavering dedication, Casey continues to make a profound impact, embodying resilience and compassion in the pursuit of justice. Casey, thank you so much for being here and, and really for being such a force of change. Thank you for having me. I've I've been wanting to do this for a long time. So I'm I'm glad that we finally, after all of the hurricanes and everything else, got time to sit down and do this. Yeah, no, it's been a long time coming. Your story is just so inspiring. And as you know, we've talked before, my family was personally impacted. There is something that not only does this experience touch you so profoundly, I think for some it becomes a calling. And mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, you wouldn't disagree with this, that for you, this, this has kind of been a calling to talk about this. So, so let's jump in you and your family, you were in military housing and with hidden mold and water damage, kind of tell us what happened, um, with your journey and, and how you guys were impacted and, and ultimately what resulted from that. Yeah. And I'll start by saying, you're right. This does kind of define some people's future. Um, there's a quote that I use at the end of one of the videos I made that said, if you want to find your purpose in life, find your wound. And that, that I feel is kind of what we have done here. Um, my uh, husband and I were, uh, we went to our first duty station. We were in our early twenties. We had three kids under the age of five and um, we got there and we all just started getting sick. And I mean, it was all over the place. It was, you know, upper respiratory, it was ear infections, it was dental issues, um, I ended up having a complete hysterectomy by the time I was 27. Um, and I just kind of said, well, we have three young kids. They pass it back and forth. But, like, this is just what it is. Like, this is what it is. And um, we moved from that duty station. And, and, and I'll start back. So when we were right before we left, there was an instance where I saw some mold underneath the bathroom floor. Well, you know, I contacted maintenance, they came in and they fixed it. And I don't know what they did to fix it. They, you know, they put up a sheet of plastic and I couldn't see in the bathroom and the next day it was gone and, you know, new floor. Okay. Um, again, didn't think too much about it. So we, we moved and we moved back to, uh, my hometown, um, and everybody got better. Everything seemed to be going well. And then we were there for about two and a half, three years, and we got orders back to the same duty station, same neighborhood, same, same floor plan, like everything. And as soon as we moved back, um, the symptoms started again. 
and then we started to see visible mold. And at that point, this place was on the news everywhere. And so it actually was on my mind. And I reached out to one of the girls that were, you know, was going through it. And she kind of walked me through some stuff. And I reached out to the person that lived in the first house after me. And she said, when you move, there was a remediation done. She sent me pictures and there was just mold everywhere underneath the floors. And, um, and so it was kind of like going back in time and looking at the symptoms we were having and what was going on. And unfortunately, those floors that the mold was under in that first house were the same floors my son learned to crawl on. And so at, you know, three months, six months, he was having good well child checks. He went back for his next one and he had um, abnormal muscle function, abnormal tone. We started to notice he wasn't sitting up and his hand was, clap, you know, clasped and and drawn up and his toes were curled on one side. And so he ended up being diagnosed with um, cerebral palsy. They said at some point he had a stroke and um, it affected the entire right side of his body. Um, it was so severe. You have grades one through four when it comes to a brain bleed. And he had a grade four, um, which is the worst that it could be. So, <clears throat> um, you know, looking back at that time, they're like, oh, these things just happen sometimes. The doctors were like, you know, we never really know what happens, but I know, I know now like what happened. Um, because the second we moved back into that same neighborhood, same type of housing, there was mold present, his seizure started and everything just got worse. And so that was kind of our story in military housing. We moved out, we, um, we've, you know, decided to litigate. Um, and then I just could not put it down. It was something that I had to continue fighting for. Um, and I think that when you are scared of something, you become obsessed with it. And so, you know, when I was younger, I was scared of thunderstorms. And so I would obsess over the weather and I learned everything I could know about the weather. And then this happened and I became obsessed and I learned everything I could about mold exposure and everything I could about military housing and the companies that own and manage the military housing. And it just kind of transformed into what it is today. Um, and it's not something that I'm willing to, to lay down yet. Yeah. I, well, first of all, I'm, I'm so sorry that this has happened to you. And, and I do want us to talk about the military housing and what you're seeing and how prevalent that is. Um, cause we're definitely going to talk about that, but something that you've said kind of, I think resonated not only with me, but probably with a lot of people listening is, you know, so much time goes by before you connect the dots. And I think part of that is the symptoms are so different among people. And I I've said this before, people think that if we had a problem with mold or problem with whatever, we would all be impacted the same way. And that is the crazy thing about exposure to mold and mycotoxins and um, water damaged buildings is they really impact people differently. And I, I think it makes it that much harder to diagnose. Now, when, when you brought this up with doctors, these things you're seeing with your son, even your own symptoms, was mold ever mentioned or? No, never. Um, as a matter of fact, even after I figured out mold was a problem, it was still a big hassle to find a doctor that would pay attention. I went to a neurologist one time and I don't even think I got the full word out of my mouth. I was like, I lived on base and we had mold. And he like stopped me. He was like, that's not what this is. And like, I never went back because I just felt like, I've already been gaslit by maintenance. I've been gaslit by the military healthcare system. Now I'm seeing civilian doctors. I'm not going to be gaslit this time. Um, but the other important thing that I, I do want to tell people, and this is my biggest mistake that I think I made. I was so focused on doing what I needed to do for my case that I was trying to find doctors that you know, would make that connection instead of just finding doctors that would treat us and make us feel better. Yeah. And so I feel like the, you know, I spent two years researching everything I could about the bad guys, 
trying to find doctors that would prove my case instead of just going to doctors that were going to treat us and make us feel better. Yeah. And I feel like I lost it, lost a lot of valuable time doing that. And so that is the one thing that I wish I could, I could go back and change is to focus more on my health and less about, you know, who's going to say what and who's going to put it on paper. Um, that yeah. was, that was one thing that I, I regret. Yeah. It is so hard because everyone deserves to be believed. Right. And you're made to sometimes think that these symptoms they're all in your head, they're random. There's no connection. Children just get sick. Moms are just tired. And it's, you start to believe that. And I, I think when you're told like over and over again, that it can't be X, Y, and Z, you start to believe it. And so many people I think are missing out on this connection between their health and where they live or where they work or where they go to school and, and we're paying the price. And, and I think the hard thing about exposure to poor under air quality is that it, it's slow and gradually just chips away at your health and allows for other opportunistic things. And then, you know, it's no wonder why this is being, you know, misdiagnosed, you know, to such a high degree. And, you know, my, I, I don't like you, um, we did not get a lot of support with some of our more traditional doctors. And I remember the moment for us, that was a turning point, hanging up the phone and thinking we are utterly alone in this. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, well, I'm going to figure this out, right? Like you have no choice. And this it's that mama bear, whatever it is, takes over. And you think like, well, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And then I know for you, and, and I, I share this too, it's like, you can't stop because there are other people out there that are still suffering. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it's so funny because I will, you know, go, I, I went recently to my son's um, doctor that does all of his Botox and stuff like that. And we've seen him off and on since my son was, you know, 13 months or, you know, when we moved away for a couple of years, you know, we didn't see him, but as soon as we came back, we started seeing him again. Well, about a year and a half ago, he mentioned something about mycotoxins and like my ears perked up. And I was like, what'd you say? And I was like, oh my gosh. And like, we just had this like heart to heart. And I was like, I am so glad that, you know, you know about this and like nobody ever, I ever talked to in the medical field knows about this and they think that we're crazy. And he was like, I had to teach myself. They don't teach this in medical school. And I've literally had to be my, my own teacher and researcher and do all of this myself because there's nobody out there teaching this. Yeah. And, you know, I just think it's becoming more and more prevalent that people are starting to understand it, but it makes me happy that somebody took it upon themselves to learn about it because it wasn't being taught to them. Um, And so I think that that was, that was like a turning point for me where I was like, oh my goodness, like the words getting out. Right. Yeah. And I've seen that too. You know, my journey started over a decade ago and there was even less information and we still have so far to go. That said, I am seeing more and more doctors and amazing law firms like yours and groups and people are organizing and they're talking about it and starting to shift that needle, which is so important. Before we move on, I did want to ask, how is every, how's everyone's health? Where are you guys now that you're living with this like level of awareness? Yeah. So, I mean, I have three kids, so the older two are are doing great. Um, they were kind of, I talk about them being in this like middle stage where they weren't super small babies, but they also weren't adults. So their bodies, you know, are, you know, I feel like they were able to heal a lot quicker. Plus they were out of the house a lot of the time at school where originally Camden was home with me and I worked at home. So he was home with me every day. Camden is still, uh, paralyzed on his right side. Um, he's blind in his left eye. Um, he did have a surgery about three years ago where we did, um, like heel cord lengthening and stuff like that. So he, he is able to walk now, but he walks with a brace. Um, he still has no use of his right hand. Um, and he still has epilepsy and seizures. Um, there is permanent brain damage. Um, 
I have uh, Hashimoto's fibromyalgia. Um, I have lesions on the brain. Um, I'm a lot better than I was. I still have trouble some days with like word finding or memory. Um, and then of course, like if you go out and you're exposed anywhere, you know, it kind of comes back and you don't feel good for a couple of days, but I'm, I'm not the person that I was 10 years ago, but I'm better than I was four years ago, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like, you know, we have long-term health issues, but we've learned to live with those and we've learned to, to kind of deal with those as they come. But, um, for the most part, it's a lot better than it was, but it'll, it'll never be what it was before. Yeah. And I think that there's some like important takeaways there, right? That this is, this is a marathon and mm -hmm. while your body can heal, like we mold is more than an allergy. We have to stop dismissing it. There are, there are things that are permanent. There are, my family is doing much, much better, but there are some permanent things. And, you know, for me, it, it's just that reminder of why, you know, there's days. And I don't know if you ever feel this way. Sometimes I just, I want to bang my head against the wall and give up and be like, I don't know, like, can, can we do this? And those moments luckily are, are fleeting and they're short. And then I'm like, yes, we can. Like we have to, yeah. like, this is too important to ignore. So let's switch just if, if you don't mind, I know yeah. you did a ton of investigating into this, how, in your opinion, how mm -hmm. problematic is mold in privatized military housing or even in the barracks and how is it typically addressed? Because you said they put up some plastic, you have no idea what they did. Mm -hmm. And, um, sometimes I, I, Michael Pinto has said this and I'm paraphrasing here, but he says sometimes the only thing worse than no remediation is bad remediation. And unfortunately bad remediation is commonplace. That is, um, I think that was the, you know, the, the trigger for, okay, well, we're not just going to let this go. We're going to do something is because they did a remediation mm -hmm. and it was awful. Like, Things were immediately worse with our health after. Um, they did not use proper containment. They There was mold all in the air handler, and they just let it sit in the middle of the living room with all of our stuff next to it. I mean, there was, there was zero containment at that point. And then they came in and cleaned the air ducts, and the ducts were one of the places where the mold was mostly at. And they just used like a wire brush and like, you know, cleaned them out. And I remember the guy like saying like, my vacuum doesn't vacuum up a hundred percent of what comes out of here. So you might have to get your vacuum or your broom out later. And I was like, <laughs> but we instantly got sick. I remember October, 2019, we moved back in and I've had a cough since October of 2019 that has not gone away. Some days is better than others but it just hasn't gone away. It's, it's stuck with me the whole time. And I remember exactly when that happened, but in my opinion, it's extremely problematic because we're making the people that are supposed to be defending our country sick. Like at the end of the day, you're making them sick. Not only that, but you have enlistment rates going down. You have legacy enlistment, which is like, you know, um, a dad and his dad have been in the military. So then their son joins the military and then their son joins the military, you know, and then their daughter joins the military or whatever the case is, that's going down. Well, why is that? Well, all three of my children are medically disqualified from ever joining the military because of injuries they sustained in their military house. That's wild. Yeah. Even if they weren't made sick, do you think that they would want to join after seeing what we went through? No. So you have that problem, but then you also have where they give you the housing allowance that is supposed to provide housing to your family. Well, if you don't want to live on base, they give you the housing allowance and you can go in town and find a house for you and your family. Well, they keep that price of that house, housing allowance low enough 
to where it almost forces people to live on base. So you're forced to live on base unless you just start paying out of pocket, you know, for, for a safe, safer home off base. And then you go to their medical clinics for your treatment when you get sick and then they gaslight you. But then at the very same time, you're all sick. You have all of these health issues that you have to have their insurance for. So now your family and or your spouse or yourself or whatever is stuck in the military for the insurance to pay for the health conditions that they caused. So it's this vicious cycle and they have you trapped. And I mean, it. that's just... Insanity. That's what it is. Yeah. That is, that's how problematic it is. Yeah. And, and I know this is not just something where you got the unlucky draw of the house. Like we've had, um, and we're going to link to these in the show notes. Kate Needham did a presentation for our summit all about military housing and Dr. Brian, um, uh, who treats a lot of, as a former, uh, person in the military and working with a lot of veterans, um, treats those impacted and we'll link to those in the show notes. Like this is not a little bit of a problem. This is, would you say a problem in the majority of base housing or? Yes. Yeah, I would. I, I would not suggest anybody live in military housing and it's not just because of mold or water damage. This is because so many military installations are toxic dump sites or, you know, super fun sites or Brownsville. Like they are living on toxic land with toxic air and toxic water, period. It is not safe. Yeah. And then you take the houses that were built incorrectly or managed incorrectly, like maintenance wise. And it's this soup of unhealthy everything, right? So you have, you know, the soil is contaminated. They didn't build the houses with proper vapor barriers. So all of that's coming into the house and you have mold and you have asbestos and you have lead-based paint. And and that's what you have. Yeah. And you have families living in there and you know and their thought process behind it is they're only here for 2 to 3 years so you know by the time that they figure things out or start getting really sick they're on to the next house and that's not how that's not how it works yeah and and you continue to accumulate exposure mm -hmm. exposure so for someone listening who may not know this like most of these homes are managed by private companies and therein lies a little bit of the problem. Can you just like speak very high level to why it's not as simple as, yeah. oh, we'll just fire the company managing the the housing and we'll get somebody better. It, it unfortunately doesn't work like that. No, it doesn't. And I will say, so back in the nineties, the military decided we don't want to be landlords anymore. And I can't say that that was a bad decision. You know, they, there's tons of other things that the military and the government have to focus on. Housing probably shouldn't be one of them. Um, so they decided we don't want to be landlords anymore. So they prioritized housing and they signed these 50 year contracts with these, you know, private companies. And there's, you know, there's lots of them. There's, there's five or six like main ones. Um, but essentially, you have a joint venture between the government or the military branch and this privatized company. And because it's on a military base or on federal land, there's just not a lot of oversight. You still have the military over here being like, ah, I don't want to be a landlord and I don't want to have to deal with it. But then who's who oversees everything, right? And they're locked in with these 50-year contracts. The issue with that is, is the same companies that are over military housing are the same companies that are over college dorms, Section 8 housing or HUD housing, senior living facilities. And so it's almost like they're preying on these people that can't defend themselves, right? That have no means to defend themselves. And that is, I think, the most frustrating part of, of all of this is, is just seeing it happen over and over again. And there being no real deterrence for it. Because, yeah, one company is going to, to exit 
And then another company is going to come in and take over it, but it's going to be the same situation because there's no oversight. Yeah. And, and people are getting sick and, and really sick um, in some cases. And if you're not in the military and you think this problem doesn't impact you, it does. Right. Like our military is, um, you know, one of our first lines of defense. And even if that doesn't motivate you, these are your tax dollars, you know, so you have, we all have skin in the game at, at some way and in some form here. So um, I, I think too, before we move on, the last thing I'll say, and I've, this is going to be like tattooed on my, or not tattooed, probably printed on my gravestone is anyone can remediate, but can they do so safely? And can they do so effectively? And so much of what we see and I know what you've seen is not safe, nor is it effective. And if you're listening to this and we've sufficiently freaked you out, I want you to take a deep breath because we do have resources. So if you go to change the foundation.org, um, there are a couple of things you can do, go to our resource tab and you can go to start here. And that literally takes you from start to finish through the steps. We're going to hold your hand. If you want a quick overview of what safe and effective remediation looks like, sign up for our newsletter because you get a free 20 page guide. It's called mold remediation at a glance. And those things that Casey mentioned, they didn't do proper containment. They didn't have proper pressure. You know, if they're just spraying chemicals on it, we take you through what it should be done so that you're not um, at the mercy. But at the end of the day, Casey, like what recourse do military families have if, if they complain about it and they want something done well? Do they have any like say in the situation or are they just at the mercy of the, the management? I would love to say that they have teeth in this. <clears throat> and myself and some of the other advocates have worked really hard. And, you know, some of them that even came before me have fought um, in DC to come up with a tenant bill of rights. And while we were all excited for this to come out, all it did was give them more ways to make loopholes. I have, I've not seen anything that has worked as well as litigation. And I know that some people are, are back and forth on whether or not that really works because obviously litigation is not going to create, you know, congressional changes, right? However, it creates deterrence. And that is the most important thing. Because as we can see with our congressional changes that we've done and that we've tried to do, it's, I mean, it's still not working. And that doesn't, that doesn't, you know, negate the fact that we're still going to do it. And we're still going to fight for it. But really the only thing that I've seen that has deterred them is that constant publicity uh, litigation because, you know, they're tired of having to pay for it. Um, you know, uh, Christina uses this all the time. You know, if, if you get a ticket, right, because you're speeding, then the next time you go down that road, you're going to say, Oh, I'm not going to speed because I don't want to pay that ticket. Right. And so that is deterrence. And that's what we're trying to do with these military housing companies. They're hard headed. And this is, this is tough. And, Families without the appropriate advocate on their side, without the appropriate legal team on their side, don't really have a lot of options. Yeah. And it's hard because you're, you're, you're sick, you're managing your own life, and now you have to be your own advocate, not just with healthcare, with housing, with, um, you know, recourse, all while, you know, juggling the ins and outs of um, being sick yourself or, or you know, taking care of your family, who's having health symptoms. So what advice would you have for a military family or, or really anyone who might be going through something similar right now? Yep. So for military families, like my word of advice would be not, don't live on base ever. <laughs> but I know that that's not always an option. It is tough because we have found nothing that works with these companies when it comes to asking them to do the right thing. The best thing that you can do for your family is to hire your own inspector. Don't take their word for it. Um, a lot of companies won't even do mold inspections. They say, well, if we see it, we'll remediate it. Well, one way you get away from having to remediate is doing testing, right? So like, if you don't do testing, you don't have to say there was mold there because you didn't test it. So you don't have to, you know, and so- With dirt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man, the stories, um, dirt, dog hair, 
wet dust. That was one of the, the most recent ones I heard. It was wet dust. Wet dust. Wow. Okay. Wet dust. Um, they, I mean, in my house, they said, do you burn candles? And I was like, no, my husband gets awful headaches from like super scented candles. No. Oh, okay. Because sometimes candles can create, you know, black stuff that kind of looks like mold. Okay. Oh, <laughs> see what you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. take good, take good notes, keep good records, you know, who said what, when, right. Um, pictures, copies of your work orders, but you know, I just with military housing, haven't found anything that works. I, I simply say, don't live there. Don't live in their housing because once their occupancy rates aren't so high and they start losing money, maybe they will take and fix things the right way. Because here's what I don't understand. You are taking money to, to Band-Aid fix something, right? And then it happens again a year later, you Band-Aid fix it again. It happens again a year later, you Band-Aid fix it again. So now you've spent three times that much money Band-Aid fixing it where you could have spent the right amount of money to fix it one time and then things are better. That's what I don't get is, is like, specifically where we were at, they were kind of coming in, replacing the floors, putting down kilts, you know, painting the floors white, essentially. But you know what the problem was? They didn't put vapor barriers in the houses. So at any point in time, did they go back and put vapor barriers? Nope. Yeah. Why? You're going to have to remediate the same houses over and over again every year. Yeah. Yeah. And every I mean, year. That's, that is the other part that I think people sometimes in all the stress forget about. Like if you don't stop and correct the moisture source, your problem is going to come back. Yeah. And it, uh, you know, obviously it's like the stupid tax, right? Like you do something like, oh yeah, I'm going to pay for that later. And, and it does blow my mind that they just don't. Yeah. Right. And right. Right, too often we've approached remediation as like a cosmetic thing. And that sounds like what they're doing, right? Oh, we'll just put right. the floor back and you know, whatever, you'll be yeah. fine instead of, instead of a health issue, which is what this is really about, right? We don't deal, um, you know, with other indoor hazards like we do with, you know, mold. And yet for some reason we just brush it under the rug and we kick the can down the road to worry about another day. It's, it's really frustrating because I mean, they have made so many people sick. In in my, the last house that I was in, the people that lived in there before me were also on our lawsuit because they also had mold in the same exact places. Like we compared our pictures, our work orders, like everything was the same. And that just kind of blows my mind. Like I, you know... With everything that's going on, you know, I understand sometimes mold happens, right? Like, yeah, you're in a superhuman environment or, you know, a windstorm could come through and, and, you know, take off some of your shingles and you don't notice. And then it rains hard and then you get some water injury, whatever the case is, right? Accidents happen, mold happens, but it's what you do after that, that means everything. And I think the point that I'm trying to make is that during this whole process, they could have chose at any point in time to be the hero or the villain of this story. And they made their choice. It was totally up to them to do what they wanted to do. And they made the decision and they continue to make that decision. And it's making people sick and it's, it's ultimately harming our national security. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When our force numbers are as low as they are, our enlistment numbers as low as they are. And then the people that are here are, are stuck. Right. I mean, I, I don't know if my husband would get out right now if he could. Um, but I can tell you that he can't, we would never be able to afford the things that my children need without the insurance and it's stuff that was caused by them. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that, that feeling of stuck is, is so I think relatable and it is one of the 
like hardest feelings to be in and whether it's military or people in uh, low income housing or rental properties, I get it. it. It is, it is the hardest thing. You are stuck between a rock and a hard place and you're stuck um, having to stay in a situation um, in order to get the insurance or whatever you need um, to heal. And there's, there's change on so many levels that need to happen, right? You've talked about it. It's not just from the government side and laws and legislation, but it's bottom up through people and coming together and taking action. So I don't know if this is a good time to segue then to, you know, are there a couple of specific changes? Obviously there are lots of changes we would like to see, but are there a couple uh, changes that you would like to see happen as a result of what happened to you? So of course there's, there's tons of changes that I would, I would love to happen. And I think that I've learned over the last five years that, like, I originally thought, like, I'm not going to let this happen to another family, right? Like, who, who was I kidding? Like, I, one person, was not going to be able to make a difference. And as much as I hate politics, it's all so political. It's about the money, and so there's so many changes that need to happen. I don't even know where to start. Like that's that's the bad part is that there's so many entities involved from, you know, I mean, this, it's tough between the insurance companies and the EPA. And I mean, there's just so many different layers that would have to be peeled back. I just want people to do the right thing. Plain and simple. Like one thing, do the right thing. I, we can't help who originally built those houses. Like you know, some military housing, super old, built in the forties. Some of it brand new. Our house was eight years old. Eight. The first house we lived in was two years old when we like when we moved into it and started having health issues. Two years old. So build them the the correct way. Use the correct building materials. Do proper maintenance. If there is a problem, fix it correctly. Don't gaslight families. Stop making them sick. You know, there, there's so many things. I, I mean, I could probably write a book on, on how many things need to change and should change. I personally just don't see a lot of that changing right now. Um, there is a huge movement. I think we're working towards it. it we're better now where we were five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, but there's still a long way to go, yeah. a long way. And I mean, I'm in it for the long haul and, you know, I can I, I plan to continue to, to help people and bring awareness, but there's a lot of change that needs to happen. And it's not just on one level. It's not just military housing. It is the building industry period. It is the remediation industry period. I mean, it is the insurance industry here, yeah. like there's, it's everything. Yeah. We talk about that all the time at the foundation. There's, there's so much work to be done and there are more and more groups, I think, coming together and you don't underestimate that, right? Like what is that right. saying about how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Um, and so if you're listening to this and you're angry, if you're upset and you want to do something about it, you can reach out to change the foundation.org. Mm -hmm. Easy. I, I'm, there's, I'm, are there military groups organizing or if, it, or anything that you can recommend for, for someone who's like, all right, like if there's power in numbers, where do I start? Yeah. So I, there's, there's different advocacy groups. I am not sure what those are anymore. I used to be really active in those. Um, but work has been really busy and taking care of the family has been really busy. So I really haven't had a lot of time, you know, in the advocacy groups anymore. But there's going to be advocacy groups. You can search like military housing advocacy groups. I would love to say that all of them are trustworthy. That's not the case either. Um, do what you feel is best for your family. The number one thing that you should do is focus on your health. Do you want to make a change? Yes. Do you want to make people pay for what they've done to your family? Yes. But focus on your health first, because that is the one thing that you can't change and you can't get back. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and I, I say that all the time too. You have to start with you and your home and focusing on that. And that's what's most important. As we wrap up, you mentioned work a little bit. Can you tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about the amazing work you're doing, whatever you're able to share? Yeah. So, um, you know, during my advocacy, I was introduced to an attorney that had been through Mold herself. And she opened up a law firm, Just Well Law. And her goal was to like be the lawyer that she couldn't find. And she had saw a video that I made and called me and we talked. And and then when she opened her firm and uh, her story went public, she needed help. So she called me and I started working for her just a little part time, you know, helping out when I could. And then it just kind of rolled into full time. And then they just grew and bigger and bigger. And I love what I do now. I feel like the healing the majority of my healing has come from this job. And I think that that is because I talk to people every day that are going through this or that have been through it. And for 30 minutes of their life, they don't feel gaslit. And for 30 minutes of their life, they don't feel crazy. And they are talking to somebody else that has been through it. And I think that means everything. And, you know, we might not be able to take on every case that comes through our door, but at least they can talk to somebody that understands where they've been and can kind of give them like the guidance of like, here's what you can do next. Or, you know, these, these, these are options. Um, I really, really enjoy it. I remember Christina asking me when she started, what is one thing that you want to provide to clients. And I said, communication, like that was the number one thing. Don't make them question anything. Don't make them go Google anything, right? Like if you have a question, call me. If you need to talk something through something, call me. If at any point in time, litigation feels overwhelming, we're not doing our job. And so it's more than just a law firm. I feel like it is a it's a group of people that really, really care. And you've taken broken people that have been through mold themselves and are still healing. And you've kind of put them together to help other people. And I think that, that is a beautiful thing. And it's different from other law firms. And if you're looking for, you know, just a regular law firm, I don't, I don't think you're going to find that with us. Um, because we are thorough and we do, we talk to everybody that calls, um, whether we can help them or not. And I think the not, like when we can't help somebody, that is really, really tough. Um, but it also gives me an opportunity to say, we might not be able to help you legally, but here are some of our resources and this is what you can do. And at the end of the day, they may have gotten like one door shut, but another one was kind of opened for them to kind of move forward because sometimes all you need is closure. Sometimes all you need is what that next step is. Okay, well, I don't have a case, but now I can focus on my health. Um, and so I, I really enjoy it. We're super busy. Um, we are actually, you know, doing other military housing cases, which has been something that has given me so much excitement. And I hate to say excitement because I'm not excited that it's still happening, but I'm excited to be involved from a different angle, right? I will sit down on a Friday night with a cup of coffee, it's like eight o'clock. Everybody's probably like, you know, out to dinner with their friends or watching movies. And I'm in here like researching, like, you know, these entities and, and their contracts and, and, you know, planning our next trip to, to go, you know, to the place that we're, we're going to be working at. And I'm excited to hit it from a, from a different aspect where I feel like I'm going to be able to help people more than I did in my own situation. I didn't have somebody helping my family. I had these two families that were going through it at the same time I was, and they were kind of guiding me along a little bit. Um, But other than that, I didn't have this, you know, this guiding path of this is what you do. Um, This is what you can do. This is what you should do. And like I said, I made the wrong choices. I focused on the wrong things. Um, And so I just want to, I want to help other people in ways that I didn't get the help at the time. Oh, amen. I hear that. I, I I feel very much the same way and, and why we walk in different lanes. I know we're all like working towards the same goal. And what I love about 
what you guys do at Just Wells, you really do, it, even if someone's not in Texas, you can mm -hmm. point them towards the resources. You can see, I know Christina and your organization, they're trying to find other lawyers in other states to kind mm -hmm. of build out this um, group of lawyers who understand and can take these cases um, because it's so important. And I, I know what you mean when you say like, I think there's something empowering when you feel like you can kind of come together and and do something, even if it's just fixing a little bit of this much bigger problem, you're taking back control. And when you go through something like this, you very much feel out of, things are out of your control a lot of the time. And so there is something I know, um, it, I know what you mean when you say you love it. It's empowering, it's satisfying, like to take back a little bit of what was taken from you, um, even if it's indirectly. Casey, it's amazing. So if somebody had questions or wanted to reach out to you, what's your contact information or the best way they can get a hold of you? Yeah, so they can go uh, straight to our website, well.law, and they can fill out the contact form on there that comes straight to my email, or they can email me directly at Casey at well.law. Um, that's C-A-S-E-Y at well.law. Um, we talk to everybody that calls, like, like you said, even if they're not in Texas, we do have referral partners in other states. Um, and so if we have one in that state, you know, we're more than happy to get your information and connect you. We don't have referral partners in every state and it waxes and wanes a lot, right? So you have some attorneys that, you know, get to capacity and they might not be able to take anybody today, but two weeks from now that could change. So never hesitate to reach out. If I don't have somebody today, I might have somebody next week. Um, but it's the least that we can, you know, that we can do to try to help people outside of Texas. Um, Christina is also doing a really great job of kind of helping other attorneys in showing them how she litigates these cases and sharing resources with them because the ultimate goal is, is for us to have somebody in every state. So it doesn't matter which state somebody calls from, I, I can connect them with somebody. Um, and that, and that's tough because there's not enough attorneys out here handling these types of cases. Um, so reach out, we'll help however we can. If, I mean, and like I said, if all it is, is a phone call, like we want to talk to you. We don't, nobody should feel alone in this. This is such an isolating thing for so many people. You know, you lose friends and you lose family. People think you're crazy. You know, your doctors think you're crazy. You know, it causes issues in, in, in marriages, you know, and Nobody should feel that isolation. So even if somebody just needs to talk, like reach out, like we will, we will talk to you. <laughs> um, because sometimes just having your story heard and being able to talk to somebody is the best healing that you could have. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what we want to provide. Obviously we want people to get compensated and, and get their recovery for things that they've been through. We know that that's not, you know, that's not a hundred percent perfect and it's not always going to happen, but at least you can have a great experience just reaching out to talk to somebody, mm -hmm. um, or, or getting the resources that you need to know what your next steps are. Yeah. I mean, that's all, that's all we can do at the end of the day is try to provide something to everybody that reaches out. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. And I've talked with Christina before too, and, and I know you guys just, you truly believe that and you, you lead with that and that is so helpful. We'll link to that, your contact information in the show notes. So people, the website and everything so that yep. they don't have to go hunting for it. Um, but also, Hey, if you're a lawyer and you're listening and these are the kinds of cases you want to get involved in, reach out as well. Uh, yep. let, you know, let's build out that, you know, resources in every state. Uh, Casey, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story and continuing to be such a force, um, because we need people like you doing the work that you're doing. So thank you. Well, I appreciate you having me and, for doing this. I remember when change the year first started and I was super <laughs> excited. I was talking to Brandon and, you know, um, just, I was super excited that it started. So I'm appreciative for you having me on and, and hope that we can do it again one day. Maybe Christina and I both sit down or something like that, but I would love um, that. We are really trying. We're trying to change what mold litigation looks like, essentially. Like it's not a one size fits all. Um, but we're trying to give people a different experience than they've had before when it comes to, to legal cases, because it's not, it's not that people are litigious. It's not that people are just greedy and they want money. 
you know, people really do have long-term issues that they need to be compensated for. Mm -hmm. And medical, like I said, is expensive. Yeah. Um, and so that's, we just, we just want to help. That's it. Yeah. I, I absolutely love that. And you guys are the team to take it on for sure. So thank you again. And for everyone listening, if you found this uh, interview helpful or inspiring or motivating, uh, what have you, and you want to hear more or get more resources, or you want to know, you know, how to start your journey, please head on over to change the And while you're there, sign up for our newsletter, because it really is the best way to get great information like this directly to your news or your inbox. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much.